Hello everybody, my name is Ian Kirk Pattycake. I'm an author, idiot, and loin streamer, and today I wanted to do a follow-up video, sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> to the response video I did last week about writing female characters. If you haven't seen it, go and check it out. Maybe, maybe giggle a little, I don't know. I, I mostly hope it's entertaining, but I also hope it's reassuring that you can pretty much explore whatever you want. But before we get started, a couple of things. Number one, if you enjoy what I do on this channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on the channel, check out the links down in the description below. Number one way to be featured is through Lemoy, where it's the monthly prompt here on the con uh, here on the channel, where I give you a prompt. You write a short story or a fragment of a story, submit it, make sure that it contains some fragment of the prompt and then the first monday video of the month it is basking in the greatness of everybody that can be fit into that the second way to be featured is if you're an indie author and you have a book out or a book that is coming out submit the first chapter and the cover and they you will be chosen at random to be read here on the channel and hopefully it'll help more readers find your book because as much as i read and like to read i'm not every book book's target audience and I also can't read every book, but if you've put in the work, you deserve to have somebody. Uh, you deserve to find the audience that your book is for, and I want to help out how I can. And then number three, if you would like to check out any of my books, the links are down in the description below. You can get them at your favorite book retailers. It might be of interest considering today's video, but that's up for you to decide. With that said, let's get into it. After seeing the video last week, or the uh, two weeks ago, whenever that was, uh, about writing female characters and emotional responses. There was, I mean, there was a lot in that video that stuck out to me of this is how females behave. But the thing that really, really stood out to me for emotional response, it was the generalization at the end that <laughs> referenced a TikTok video as being, this is how women actually show anger and um, denying that there is any female that shows extreme emotional response with anger. And so then this prompted me to have a discussion. <laughs> I hope she doesn't mind me saying, but this prompted me into a discussion with, you know, my creative partner, somebody that I could not be without it at the moment, Monty. And we were, t I was, I was talking about our characters because we have so many characters together now at this point, there's probably going to be more. It's only been not that long but there's so there's probably gonna be more but so i was talking about our characters and the variations our characters and then also my characters in general but this prompted a discussion of what my female character's anger response is and so then i just wanted to talk about behavioral pathology today maybe some personality pathology and what causes a character to act or respond the way that they do because there is no one way a person is going to respond to anything based on their demographic for me um, with my interest in psychology, with my degree in forensic psychology, with my the way that I write and the way that I read, I am always looking for what the character says about themselves, what the book tells me about the character, how their background and personality manifest through their behavior and through the way that they interact to, to uh, situations around them. And this is one of the big things that I look at when I'm analyzing text and then I'm giving feedback or I'm doing my book reviews here is the plot and the character, do they make sense for how the character is acting and what I have been told? So like, if you're ever wondering how I'm going to respond or if I like your book, the number one way to make sure that I don't hate a book is to make sure it makes sense within its own universe and the characters act within the contexts that I've been given for who they are or what they are. And there can be lying within the text, but if the author is lying to me about who the character is, that's where the problem comes from. So I wanted to talk about so I wanted to spring off of that with the anger response and then go through some of my characters and why they are the way they are. And I would love to hear about your characters down in the comments below. If you have done some sort of character studies or some character analysis on your own characters, or have you not done them before? And if you think about it, how do they manifest their background and their personality and their disposition? Uh, I would love to hear about your characters. So. For me, behavior and uh, emotional response has to is is a, is a combination of um, natural disposition, you know, uh, chemicals, biology, and experience. The way that we have trained ourselves to respond to things. For me, I know that I've got my own dispositions for uh, interacting with people. <laughs> I got my own difficulties for interacting with people that are neurological. 
And, and, and those were exacerbated when I was a teenager because of uh, the trauma that I was going through with my parents' divorce. I can actually pinpoint a couple of key places that my emotional responses were changing because of what was happening at the time that included, I would, I had always been uh, a more distant child. Like when I was very, very small, I did not try to socialize with people. I lived in my own little world. I remember going to church and having my teddy bear that I would just sit on the middle of the floor in the children's room and I would hold that bear. And that's all that I needed. I would just sit in my own head with my bear and not try to talk to people. I didn't try to make friends with people. I didn't care about other people. I didn't communicate very well. And then even, you know, when it was time to sing in church, I didn't stand up. I covered my ears a lot because the sound was too much for me. Uh, they tried to make me put my bear down and I just didn't listen because I didn't want to put the bear down. I was just doing my own thing. I wanted to be in my own little bubble and do what I needed to do for me. Uh, there was even a time when apparently I had wanted, I was just like, you know, this big, I was not very old and I'd apparently wanted to go play on the playset outside of the church. And so I just left the nursery. I didn't talk to any adults. I didn't ask anybody anything. I just walked out. And it turns out that I walked like three or four miles away from the church looking for the play set and somebody found me walking along the side of the road. So like, I've always just kind of been this socially not connected sort of person. And it's been more difficult in the last couple of years as I've learned more about how I communicate or I don't communicate because of um, an inability on my part to be able to understand when and how to interject in conversations and because of posture or or maybe some inappropriate dispositions in conversations because I don't quite understand certain things on an interpersonal level because of my own difficulties. And so then stuff ends up being taken the wrong way because I have this posture that doesn't match the Siri, the tone of the conversation. And then, yeah. So I understand that stuff. And then I understand that when I was going through my parents' divorce when I was 11 or 12, there was so much turmoil around me from my older brothers falling apart, from my mother falling apart, from my sister falling apart, that I very distinctly remember saying that while everybody is falling apart, I need to be strong. And I remember looking after... Um, Character, some characters on television that were just stone-faced in their emotional responses and using those as role models saying, that's what I need to be like. And it's okay to be that way because these characters are strong. So I used that to say, this is what I should be. And I remember being made fun of for acting like a robot or being too robotic and being told that something was wrong with me because I should have been more emotive and I should have been crying and I shouldn't have been smiling all the time because I took what should have been just like not emotionally responding to actually any time that I was supposed to have a sort of negative response to smile instead to get through it because that was what I was supposed to be doing to be strong for other people. And so that became a thing. And I'm already fairly emotionally blunted. Um, and so that didn't help with the emotional blunting and uh, the, the, uh, the awkward interactions with other people where I would then be misread because I'm not having that internal situation in most cases that other people are having. And I have to try to read what I don't understand is going on. Anyway, so that's all a way of me talking about my own pathology to some extent and how I recognize how I develop and how I am. Um... To get into some characters, I'm going to use anger, I think, for a lot of them as a jump off board because I could talk so long about all of these characters in many different ways, but I'm going to try to keep the scope clear. Some of them I think are very interesting. I do have Hitomi from uh, my Yakuza stuff where she doesn't have an anger response at all. Before I get into all of the book stuff, just know that there are going to be some probable spoilers in here because I'm going to have to discuss kind of the background of some of these characters and what happens to these characters and how they respond to, to in order to better uh, explain how they respond to things. So the first characters that I'm going to talk about are from uh, Dead End Drive, my debut satirical novel. The first I want to talk about is Gavin, who is the butler um, of the estate. His father was the head butler when his father was alive. His father was also an alcoholic who ended up killing Gavin's mother and then burying her outside. And uh, that was his. That was his father taking out anger on the fact that Gavin was an an asocial, 
not normal acting child and he blamed his wife for his child not acting correctly and gavin's father also living at the estate and seeing the new child which was kelly when he was brought in and how that child was normal and his own child was not normal that made gavin's father so angry that he blamed his wife and ended up killing his wife and gavin actually even though he's a psychopath he he wanted to kill his father for that he, he saw his father kill his mother and then he saw his father going after Kelly. And he actually had a problem with this guy who has so much power, destroying things, destroying things that are weaker than him. So Gavin went mano y mano, that battle of the men moment, that coming of age moment for him, where he ended up just killing his father and then burying his father. Gavin's, Gavin's anger response is uh, more explosive, though it tends to also, it hits a high, and then it hits a moment where he does something and then it comes back down. He is much more likely to be aggressive and to get physical. As you also see at the end of Dead and Drive when he beats Matthias, he <laughs> he uses his anger at Matthias to fight Matthias physically. And then once he has clearly won and Anna has gotten him to his feet, he's still not over his anger. So he's still kicking Matthias while Matthias is down because he's like, fuck you. So <laughs> Gavin is very physical and he will freaking destroy you if he feels like destroying you. Um, Anna, on the other hand, she is, when she gets angry, she's not very emotive, period. She is very, um, she keeps to herself. She's, ex her expression is blunted, but she obviously feels things. However, when she feels emotion, she goes into action. So if you think of, there's a moment in Dead and Drive where Anna hears, one of the other characters talking about her father and disrespecting her father. And she has much loyalty and much love to her father. She has much love and loyalty to the family that she considers her family. And so when she hears this guy, she comes up behind him with a pot and slams it over his head. She doesn't make a noise. She doesn't say anything. She doesn't have explosive anger because her anger turns immediately into action as a manner of expression. So she goes and she knocks him out and then they drag him out and they bury him. And when she has that high level of passion as well, after the, the murder, it comes out through Gavin and Anna having Kelly and they're working out their stress and their exhaustion and exactly what they just went through. Um, through the two of them having sex because they are their life partners. If you follow her actions throughout the story, almost everything she does is communicated through action as opposed to words. When she's being hunted by Alex, all of her responses are almost all her taking action because she speaks her emotions and she speaks everything that she does through her actions. She has a lot of she's not totally psychopathic, but she is her expression is blunted. Then you have Kelly, whose anger response is obviously yelling because he's kind of infantilized. He never really matured. He was treated like a child. He he grew up for the first six years on the streets, and he never learned really how to take care of himself. He never was really socialized. And even surrounded by adults when he moved into the Benedict estate after his adoption, he was just more treated like a pet and dismissed as opposed to being treated like a person who needed that socialization to know how to act and interact with others. So when he gets angry or frustrated, he tends to start yelling. He will throw things, but he won't like attack people. You see a part in um, Dead End Drive where he's trying to read a book. He can't read, so he gets frustrated and he throws the book because he doesn't know what else to do. But he also knows that people are dangerous because of the time he spent on the street. So he doesn't get angry at people because he knows that people can hurt him. But if he is angry, he will yell and he will throw things. And even though he's 14, he's very immature because he's never been properly socialized. He's never been properly taught how to interact with others, how to deal with his emotions or how to respond to things negatively and cope with them. So he'll end up throwing tantrums like a child that a 14 year old probably in ways a 14 year old probably shouldn't be acting. And that's just because of his upbringing of the situations that he grew up in and his lack and his poor <laughs> coping skills. At the end of Dead End Drive, K Kelly is about to, you know, he's got some mentorship. He's got some parents that are going to help him learn how to be a more functional adult in the next couple of years. That's for sure. And then you have Matthias, who is a chameleon style character, and he becomes whatever he needs to become in order to get the advantage. And that had to do with him also being a street kid um, and who who is mistreated by the world and discovered the only way for him to get ahead 
was to lie and to trick people and to be whatever they wanted you to be because people will let you get away with anything if you let them if you make them if you become what they want you to be as long as you do that people really don't question you because they like it when they are supported for whatever they are and if they believe you in what you are then you have an invisibility cloak so there are lies throughout the book that matthias tells and there are truths here and there but you have to figure it out his his anger response is also more subtle because it's a controlling anger it's a conniving anger it is an under the surface anger that you watch in the way that he interacts with the other people and wants to destroy in kelly he sees innocence that he'd already lost and that he wants to solely so that when he is gone Kelly can continue the anger that he has. The way that he expresses his anger, taking it out on others and specifically targeting the innocent that he believes he can corrupt in order to continue his anger and destruction and destructive impulses into the future. And that's by tar targeting especially children because you can train children is his belief. So those are some of the anger responses and some of the pathology background on some of the characters from Dead End Drive. If I went into heavily of everything, we would be here forever. So forgive me if this is kind of all over the place. I'm trying to give a, a rundown of some of the, the more important backgrounds of behavior for some of these characters uh, in a more clipped way. <laughs> and if you have any questions or are more interested in any of them, also let me know. But you can also see them in action in their respective books. Now, Joey's pathology... <laughs> now, Joey's anger response comes from watching her parents, where both of them would argue when they were angry. Her dad probably did not, like, physically touch the wife, but he did drink, he did yell at her, he did cuss at her, she cussed back, she yelled back, and then one of them would drink, one of them would walk away, probably mom would walk away, and then dad would just drink because he felt guilty until it became a boiling point where mom just finally left and didn't come back. Joey then learned how to cope with her emotions through her father, uh, which becomes mostly yelling to compete back. And you see this in a way with, I think in the first book of Body Moore, uh, when she's she hears her dad coming down the hall and she tries to yell at him, you know, everything is fine, but she also tries to be snarky with him until she really hears him coming and then she gets scared because she knows that he's going to be physical with her after she was eight years old he became physically abusive which is also how she has kind of learned to cope with her anger growing up from 18 or from 8 to 23 it's yelling to violence um and you see this in book two particularly with joey because she is <laughs> spoiler alert she's become a ghost before the end of book one and as a ghost, you're vengeful, you're, work, you're easy to work up, you, you lean into your worst impulses. And for her anger, she gets physical. And that's also why she ends up chain smoking into book two, where she's not smoking the same level in book one or book three, because the chain smoking is something she does for comfort, to get her to calm down, to come back down. And so instead of throwing things like her impulses say, she tries to get busy and use the nicotine to pull her back down. Um, in book two, you see her be kind of ugly with her throwing a bottle at Jag in Jag's house when they're having an argument. And then she, I think, she lays on the floor and screams at the ceiling. And it's not great. And she knows she's out of control, but she can't stop herself to the point that she does these things. And then she's laying on the floor and she's embarrassed because she just did that to Jag and she couldn't stop herself. It's the same impulse that you see in the way that her father acted, where her father would get angry. Her father would then beat her and then her father would be like, I am so sorry, Joey. She just, she learned that same method of coping from her father and it shows through. Meanwhile, you go over to Jag, who has an ungodly amount of patience to be dealing with Joey in this situation, but he loves her. And one of the reasons that, one of the things that makes him so able to deal with her is having dealt with his father, an alcoholic who relapsed and would sometimes try to get physical with his mother and then he would step in. His father wasn't a total piece of shit. His father would just relapse and then would lose control. And Jag believed that if somebody is trying, because his father tried, and his father would just have bad days. And he and his family did not believe that his father was worth just throwing out if his father was going to try. Because you can have bad days and you can try to, but, but you have to try and show that you're trying in order to deserve the people around you trying. And that's the same thing that Jag does with Joey throughout, is every time Joey loses her anger or lies to him, 
He gives her chances to show, not just say, but to show that she's trying and she's listening and she's acknowledging what she did. Book three of Bodymore has so much of Jag calling Joey on her lying and her having to admit it because he keeps pushing her. And he's like, you need to be honest or this is not going to work. In book two, he also starts challenging her more, especially with the relationship of especially in their relationship of what is more important to you. Is it me and you, Joey, or is it you and Wayland? Because you need to make it clear where your priorities are right now because we are in trouble because of the way that you're treating me, the way that you're treating him. We need to define this so you can learn how to act appropriately. He doesn't, he doesn't say it in that way and he doesn't force anything, but Joey actually is forced to stop just leaning into our impulses of where to run at any given moment to realize what she's doing to the people around her. And that's part of her journey overall. With Wayland, he never really was in situations where he could respond with anger. Like there wasn't really a whole lot of drama in his family. His family was very nice, um, but he would get frustrated specifically with seeing Joey get beat by her father and not being able to do anything because Joey wouldn't talk about it and he didn't want to make Joey angry because he didn't want her to run off. And he got frustrated in watching Jag with Joey because he saw the flirting. But he also knew that Jag was stronger than him and he didn't have the impulses to hurt anybody until he died. And then his desperation as a ghost became a power of leaning into those worst physical impulses to destroy and that be and, be and because of his lack of this emotional turmoil in life he never really learned how to cope with the worst of the negative impulses like joey shows some restraint and some ability to fight back on doing the worst things but wayland can't and you see it in his escalating violence you see it in how he talks to joey at the beginning of book one and then lies to her about everything being okay and then ends up killing somebody and you also see it in book two when he's killing that person inside of his house and he just loses control because he is stabbing the heck out of that guy. And it takes him a second to be pulled back because he does not have the skills and the experience to have learned how to cope with that level of intensity. So it takes him for a ride before he can slow it down. Now, KC, who is the secondary bar owner with Ralph, is a very interesting case because he is he is a ghost but he was violent before he died because his father was physically violent his father was physically violent with his mother and then physically violent with him when casey was a child he saw his father kill his mother and then drag her body out of the door and when he was a child he was told what are you looking at do you want to go next and so then he was used to that brutality but because his mother took beatings for him and defended him as a child, he grew up with this soft spot for women. Um, and it may not always show through in certain ways because he's flirty, but he is a ladies man and he doesn't like seeing women mistreated because of the way that his father hurt his mother and then eventually killed his mother. You'll never see him abuse a woman. And if a woman is like touching him, getting aggressive at him, is starting to yell at him, he is more likely to shut down and then walk away. Uh, but if a man is doing that with him, he is going to punch you. But he would never touch a woman. He would never even, if if she is getting all up in his face and shoving him, you will see him do one of these because the last thing he wants to be is his father because that is so burned into his skull. As a child, he also very likely listened to his father, had to listen to his father, uh, sexually assaulting his mother through the walls because he couldn't do anything. He was a child. Um, and so he has a lot of... He has a very big soft spot for not allowing men to abuse women from having to watch his father and listen to his father abuse his mother and not be able to do anything. And that all boiled over when he was 16 and it became his only one of us is going to survive this night and he killed his father. Finally getting the vengeance that he, he believed his mother deserved and taking his father's castle via, you know, taking his father's house and social security money and, and taking over. His anger then is almost most of his anger is defensive but he proves through that and as he grows as a character that his anger is defensive he also is kind of disassociated and doesn't really care about other people unless you get in his circle 
once you are in his circle of people that he cares about in the same way that he loved his mother, he will go to the ends of the earth. He will do total brutality to make sure that you are safe and cared for. And that is what he shows to Ralph, which is also very interesting because at first he thought Ralph was pathetic. Uh, and he associated Ralph with his mother who just got beat down. Except the difference between Ralph and his mother was that Ralph should have been fighting back because he was a man. That's what Casey believed is, look, my mom cannot beat my father, but you're a man. You don't have to stand down while you're getting beat up by these other kids on the schoolyard. Why are you doing that? You're pathetic. They're going to keep beating you until they don't. And Casey specifically has emotions for that because his father kept beating him until he killed his father. And so he is directly instructing Ralph that you're pathetic until you deal with the way that these people are, t are, are bullying you and fighting you and destroying you, and you're just letting them do it. But Ralph is a cinnamon roll of a character, and he never wants to cause harm. He never wanted to cause harm. And all he ever wanted to do was find a family and find love because he was a foster child that just Baltimore hated. The city just hated him, and the city wanted to kill him because of the way that the way that his heart was born to be this hope and this this healer that's all part of his story you're gonna have to read body more zero to get a better uh better insight of it and you're gonna have to read the second book in the numinous series by by monty in order to get even more uh of all of that but yes I know I'm so scattershot with how with these characters I am so sorry uh <laughs> All things considered, there is, I could talk about Jan and Blake and Cain and Abel, but since this video is already so long and so scattered, and I'm not even sure it's going to make sense in talking about pathology and personality and history and how these characters developed into who they are, since I'm giving you very, very summarized histories for them, I'm going to finish this off by talking about Hitomi. Uh, since at the beginning of this, I mentioned her. And she is my character that does not have an anger response because she never really could have an anger response. Her disposition in general is already just not super expressive. And she was a hardworking child, a disciplined child. She came from a great family with both of her parents being loving. But her mother got ill when she was probably seven, eight, nine, and then her mother died when she was 13. And they had a family owned restaurant that was very small. It was passed down for generations in their family. And as soon as her mother died, or went, as soon as her mother went into the hospital, it became harder and harder to pay the bills. Oh, she started helping more and more out at the restaurant because there was the empty spot where her mother used to be and they needed to make the money. And they were having a harder time being able to pay employees. So there was her. And because of this bad stuff happening, she just had to put her head down and focus on getting through things. She couldn't complain. She didn't need to complain. She just wanted things to be better. But as her father got more desperate, he started taking out loans. He started doing gambling to try to make up the money to pay for the things for the restaurant and for the wife's medical care and for the wife's medical bills. Eventually her mother died and this turned into Hitomi needing to focus more on helping with the family and taking care of her father and taking care of helping her father with the debt um, until her father fell into trouble from taking money from the wrong people. And then there were these super powerful, you know, gangsters over her and her family. And there's no getting angry at the situation. There's no getting angry at those that have that kind of power over you because you are a child, you are weak, and they are an organized crime syndicate. So having that anger response doesn't do anything but put you in danger. All you can do is focus on your work and keep on it. So for the next couple of years, between 15 and 19, 16 and 19, and she's working alone in this restaurant because her father was taken away, all she can do is work and focus. And so she doesn't have an angry response. It never was beneficial to her. Just already with her disposition of being an obedient and a sweet child and a hardworking child. And then it just turns into this thing where there was no purpose or any situation that she could have where anger meant anything. So it was just suppressed. Just like she doesn't really say when she has problems. It's, she doesn't communicate very well because there was never anything that she could communicate. She was ashamed of the situation she was in with her family um, and with herself, with her failing out of school or failing in school. And so it mostly just suppressed and she doesn't communicate her feelings well. She doesn't communicate her needs very well. She doesn't communicate uh, information very well. She's very blunt and 
so that can just make communication in general difficult. She never communicated her sadness or her struggles to her friends at the time until her friends just fell away, and by friends I mean Naoki, and eventually she was alone and nobody knew what happened because her, fr her only friend went one way, her father was gone, and she was just stranded in this restaurant just trying to survive and so out of her league by what she was surrounded by that it was just going through the motions and there was nothing that she could feel. That's a short version of how Hitomi uh, landed where she is to the point that when she has an emotional response, it takes an awful lot uh, to coax it out of her, but then she lets it go. Like when she finds out that her father was killed, even though she's been working all these years and being let on and told that if she worked hard enough, he could come back, he would come back. She finds out that he was killed and they didn't tell her and she has to hold it together until her friend comes back into town for work on the weekends. And then they finally get to a place after her friend is done at work, after they're in the safety of privacy, where she breaks down and says, this happened to my father. But she's not allowed to show that she knows that because it puts her in danger for even knowing that. So she still, again, has to continually suppress what she feels. And so it's only in these blips of um, extreme anguish and the right opportunity that it, the facade and her, her walls finally break down and she is vulnerable. But this problem, this stoicism causes problems in her personal relationships with nobody ever really knowing what's wrong with her until it's very, very obvious that something is very, very wrong with her. Now, these are all such quick, <laughs> quickly summarized versions of their personalities and some of their backgrounds. But I love them so much, which is why, like, Hitomi needs to be written out. Why other people connected to them need to be written out to show just how they are. I love the exploration of character, of personality, of experience, of background, and how it shows through in actions and choices and plot and character. And, oh, it's my favorite thing of all. So if you want to see any of these characters and actions, check out their respect respective books or stories bleed more body the third the third body more book where you'll get to see more of casey uh and what he what he is and what he feels like for ralph will come out later this year next year get ready for body more zero where you get the origin story of ralph and casey so you can see even more of them and uh you're gonna have to wait around or just kind of hang out to see when <laughs> when Hitomi and Katsuo and Michi and that whole family of characters uh, becomes available because I love what's developed so much with them and their characters are so deep and meaningful and the way they interact with each other is... I can't say how much I love Hitomi and Naoki and Katsuo and Shigemi and Kaede and Michi. It's, it's insane what's come out of what started as a silly joke on the Discord, Abigail. But it's amazing. Anyway, those are some of my characters, some ideas for their backgrounds, how their backgrounds show in their personalities and their emotional responses, and also to give an idea of what I'm looking for when I'm reading books and how I'm interpreting things. So maybe that gives a little more insight to some of my book reviews when I'm talking about character and... Uh, where stuff fails and why stuff fails. I hope that helped you to maybe think about your characters if you don't think about your characters in this way. And again, I would love to hear about some of your characters, why they are the way they are, uh, how they are, and why they are the way they are down in the comments below if you'd like to share. Or if you're not a writer and you would like to share some of your favorite characters and why they're your favorite characters from TV, games, books, whatever, I would love to hear that because characters, personality, that is my jam. With that said, thank you so much for watching me ramble about characters, and uh, that's all there is. Have a great weekend, and don't die. Was that Wayland Cross in the trunk? Do you know, or is that something that's still being figured out? The person in the trunk was not Wayland Cross. Is he in trouble? We don't know who did it, but as the owner of the car, the longer he's missing, the worse it looks for him. Cross isn't a killer. For the last couple of years, the average number of murders in Baltimore has been over 300, and it's been going up. Mind you, that's only whatever the badges count as official murder, and believe me, there are people that don't count when they die. Wayland? If you're down here, tell me. I'm not talking to the badges, I just... I've been looking for you. They found a body in your trunk. Way. 
Why? Did you do that? To the left, plain black letters read along the wall. You walked in the corridor. Once that ends, you chose the dark is on the right. My vision goes blurry, flickers black and black and black for longer intervals until I can't see anything at all. I'm not screaming anymore, but my voice echoes back to me. Where the hell am I? You're dead, Josephine. Even smart people do stupid shit sometimes, right? <laughs>